who are you and how did you get into guitar playing, really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, right, rough, like roughly, like, you know. No, 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 it's just all... So, I'm Ainsley Visser, and, um, yeah, I got my first guitar when I was eight. Got it, put it for my eighth birthday. And kind of was pretty obsessed with it from the word go. I'd, I'd wanted one for a few years. My dad had a guitar when I was a lot younger than eight. Um, but he just, I never actually saw my dad play it. He just had one on top of the wardrobe. And I used to sort of like play around with yeah. it as like a toy, like detuning the strings and plucking them and stuff. And I didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, one day I, I knocked it over and snapped the head off it. So he wasn't happy. And I was probably about six years old at that point. And uh, I kind of just pestered them. And then they got me one for my eighth birthday with the agreement that we'll get you one if you actually learn to play the damn thing. Which <laughs> I kind of like went to school and, you know, took lessons at school, but wasn't really into the she'll be coming around the mountain type of stuff they were doing. I wanted to play, you know, Layla. And, mm. you know, so I kind of just did my own thing, learned to play by ear from listening to my dad's records and then picked it up pretty quick because the thing is when, you, when you're that sort of age when you're eight eight nine you know kids pick things up so quick um, I kind of just took to it really and then I was out gigging in pubs from when I was about 13 really? and then it, I'm carrying on from there really so what, what was the point where you thought this is what I want to do this is my career path what was that sort of spark so to say do you know what? I, it was always just something I enjoyed. It was never. It was just a hot. It was a hobby. Just something mm. I was just obsessed with. I'm, I'm crap at football. I'm crap at sports <laughs> because most of the time, with all my mates were out and kick around, I'd, I'd just be like in my bedroom listening to like you know some Jimi Hendrix or something on my dad's record player, trying to figure it out. And um, so it wasn't actually until I went full time with music as a career. I think, yes, I'd have been like 21, 22. Okay. And up until that point, it was, it was literally just, you know, I used to go out, I think from like, from leaving school at 18, I just went to get a regular job because the idea of being a musician just never occurred to me. And I, I ended up doing, I was, I was, so I had a regular day job at 18 till about sort of 21 and a half, 22. And I'd be out gigging three or four times a week as well. And I kind of built up a bit of a following around the immediate area where I live, like around the Midlands, and then um, I got an offer of a of a deal, like a record deal, in 1998, uh, to like you know basically go and record an album and go on tour. So it was it was being offered a deal and basically being told, yeah, you can actually go and do this for a living. Um, that kind of you know you there was an option. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was that? Sort of first album like recording that was that quite a massive learning curve and it was yeah I mean I've never worked with a producer before so I mean I'd actually done two albums before that which was just like self finance kind of you know the kind of thing you sell at gigs you know to your local yeah. band or um, so so the first proper commercial one I did when I signed the label that was actually my third album by that point but I'd never worked with a producer before I'd never been into a studio and spent more than one or two days making a you know a whole album because up until that point it was like you know go into a finer studio a local studio and just go in and play the live set two or three times and then okay mix yeah, it. yeah but obviously when you're doing it <laughs> properly as in like you know you're actually you know putting a proper album out that's you know it's got a bit of time and effort you know to spend 10 days making an album that was like well, what are we going to do for 10 days <laughs> <laughs> we know the songs but how are we going to <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But then, of course, the whole thing of like, you know, going in and like multi-tracking. So, are we, are we going to do the drums first, and then the bass, and then the guitar, and then do the, your vocals? That was really weird. It was like, oh right, okay. Because the first two albums that, that I did, um, we, just, we just did it live. We just did it like we do when we do gigs. You know, um, I think I might have even sang live as well. I think on those oh, first well. um, I can't remember. Um, but and then to sort of like do it all separate, it was like it was weird because it's you know you've spent at, at that point I spent you know nine sort of ten years going out gigging and 
learning how to do it in a particular way and then you go into the studio and it's like oh no you don't do it like that here you do it separately you do all the parts separately so it was it felt really kind of clinical and methodical and i really didn't like it as, to start with so quite, quite, I, quite a big adjustment then to go in yeah yeah and it, again it's, it's like all these things you know if you've never done it you just know doing yeah. it different but having a producer that sort of gets you to play the songs as you play them live and it's like right okay so that guitar solo that lasts for three minutes there, we need to cut that down. There's an intro there that goes on for a minute and a half before you start singing. We need to cut all that out. Wow. It was kind of like, oh, wow. It's almost like <laughs> someone someone taking something you've worked so hard on and just like pulling it apart and being like, no, I don't like that, bring it off. And do it this yeah. way and sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was like that, yeah. And um, just... It was just it was it was a it was a learning curve. It was a real learning curve. And then, obviously, following on from so that was in '98. As, as I started to record more and more after that, you kind of go into a studio knowing what you're mm-hmm. you're going in. You know you're going to be in for say two or three weeks, and you know you're not just going to be like bashing out your live set, you know, in an afternoon. It's going to be like each song you're going to like carve away at it and craft it and add a bit, you know. You know, instead of like, you know, live, you might just have guitar, bass, drums, and keys. On the album, you might add some extra guitar parts. You oh, might yeah. add some. All that kind of stuff. It's just like, it's just, it's like, it's a learning curve, you know, and yeah. you learn pretty well. You know, I guess what, what are you know, 11 kind of albums deep? Around that? So yeah. Do, I, you, do you start writing I, songs knowing that? So when he was telling you to make the intro short or make the solo short, when you write songs now, does that come into your head and you sort of think, right, that's enough guitar solo for this song? Yeah, you kind of, you do start to get used to the different, env- I mean, basically playing live is one discipline and being in the studio, it's a different head, you need a different head space. Because you're trying to do a different thing, you know, like a three or four or a ten minute guitar solo live might work. Obviously, mm. if, you know, the audience are with you on an album after a couple of minutes, it's going to be too much and you kind of learn that it's, it's, a, it's an experience or a maturity thing um so now yeah i mean even even the live set now you know or probably for the last 10 15 years yeah i'm i'm always aware of like you know the right proportions of stuff and not having too much of this or too yeah. much of that and so again yeah when i write i'm a lot more aware of well i'm aware of a lot more than i was you know back when i started so when you're when being guitar players, we love a solo. How do yeah. you sort of go around structuring a solo for recording? I mean, how does that transfer to live? Do you, do you play what you play on the record live, or do you like loosen the improvisation? Okay, so if it's a song I've written and we've not really done it much live, so it's, it's kind of like, you know, ends up being developed in, in studio. The guitar solos, I will normally... I normally sort of face it, I, I try and be quite melodic, you know, mm-hmm. with but not trying to just whittle and licks and, you know, for the sake, I try and, when I play guitar now, certainly in terms, in terms of guitar solos, I try and have the guitar solo where it's it's a part of the song, it's like, you know, it complements the song, so it's kind of got like a tune to it. When we go out live and recreate that, I might start off with something similar to what I played in the, in the studio, but live, it's every night's different. Mm. And you know you might have certain like your little motifs that you know are actually written into the song, little parts. Um, but after that, I, I I definitely don't play. I never play it the same way twice live in the studio. It's a bit more. Yeah, depending on what kind of song it is. If it's like a sort of a bluesy, just a balls out rock song, I might just just go mental for a couple of takes and see which is the best one, and just you know improvise and see how it goes. Or if it's a more structured song based thing I'll probably what I've done on a couple of songs actually uh, a couple of the more sort of song based uh, material I do is I'll actually sing out a solo oh okay so I can because I I can hear the melody or I can hear the tune in my head of what I want to play so I'll sing it out just so I've got a reference and then I'll sort of work out how to play what I just sang and that will be the starting point and then I'll go from there transpose that to the guitar and go from there and then when you go live have some fun yeah, with it yeah, as well. Pretty, yeah. yeah. So um which one do you prefer then? Recording or performing? 
I, I like them both equally. I would say, I'd say performing live has probably got the edge just because it's, it's kind of, it's, it's just a really good feeling. It's like if, you know, if you play on stage with, with if the band's cooking that night, you know, the sounds with them, the crowds with you, you know, it's, I mean, like, it's, it's a feeling like no other. You just can't describe it. It's just, it's like a, a euphoric feeling to like, stand on stage where you know every, all every, the band's firing all four, four cylinders the audience are really into what you're doing um yeah it's hard to describe but yeah i mean that definitely that kind of energy sometimes in the studio can be hard to create because it's you kind of you know you might be recording at you know 11 o'clock in the morning and you're trying to recreate that that vibe that you've got yeah. when you play live um but it's it's a different headspace you know when you're in the studio it's more of a you know, as much as you're trying to capture a performance, you know, either vocally or guitar-wise or with the bass or drums, it's a different, it's just a different headspace, it's a different thing, and I've learned to kind of like, set, you know, approach each thing with a different head, whereas when I first recorded, I was trying to do everything in the same mindset, you know. So obviously you're, you're on what you would call tour now, you've got loads of dates coming up, including soon, which yeah. is close to me. Uh, What's that? Including Froome, which is close to me, so I'll be there. Yeah, Froome. Is that, that's the cheese and grain, right? Yeah, that's just around the corner from the pedal show, isn't it? Where they record. Yeah, I mean, do you know what? I, I, I played that place for the first time last, I think it was last September. Uh, it was actually Mick that recommended it to me, actually. Mm. And Mick said, oh, you know, get a gig there. And I've heard a few people mention it, and I, I know quite a few of my friends. I mean, most of my friends are kind of in music in some capacity. A, a lot of my friends have played it. So, yeah, we played it, and it was a great night. So we, we basically booked straight back in. So, yeah, we're back there in September, I think. Yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. So, um, what's something people don't realise about touring? That, like, they, they sign up for these big tours. They might want to go on these big tours, but then a few, few gigs in or a few <laughs> weeks in, trying to, they might hit them. Okay, cool. So, being on the road in a touring band... Um, I think, okay, so I think the perception a lot of the time is that it's a non-stop party, mm -hmm. you know, because the, especially with social media these days, like Facebook, Instagram and that, you get like a highlight reel of all the good parts, you know, you know, you, you've thrown your head back, you're in the middle of a solo, you've got your foot on the monitor, your hair's blowing, <laughs> and this is what people see, and it's, yeah, that is part of it, but that's just a small, you know, it's a couple of hours in one day. What people generally don't see is all the behind the scenes stuff, the traveling, setting up, the loading in, the loading out, the no sleep, um, the, you know, like anything, you know, things go wrong on tour. You know, sometimes you have issues with sound, sometimes you have, you know, um, van troubles or whatever. What I would say is to anybody who's not been on the road, uh, it's uh, it's grueling. It's uh, it's like um, physically, it's absolutely draining, absolutely draining. Um, it's just massively tiring. And of course, the thing is, you, you know, you get to you get to the end of the gig, you're on a high. You're chatting to people at the end of the show. You're signing CDs. Everyone's happy. You might have a few beers. And of course, once you come down from that, you know, then you go to your hotel. You go. You get, you get some sleep hopefully <laughs> but then i mean a typical day is you get up in the morning um you make it to breakfast before it finishes which normally it's never any later than 10 you know you might not have got into your hotel room until 2 a.m you know or later it depends on what ha what's happened the night before so you're up you probably have like five or six hours sleep you're up you get breakfast you get your things together, you're in the van, you're travelling to the next city by that point. Um, loadings are normally around about 4pm, 5pm at the latest. So you might have like, I mean, the tours we do, we generally have a show every day for six or seven days, a day off, another six or seven shows in a row, a day off. It's, you know, it's a show every night, different city every night. So every day during the day, you're in the van, you're travelling, you're driving. Um, get to your next show at four, Load in, you set up your sound check, you go for some food, go back to your hotel, get showered, 
go and do the show. After show, bit of chit chat, back to your hotel, 2 a.m., 8 a.m. again, you're up. Oh. And you do this often. And um, yeah, it's physically, um, it's, 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 it's very physically demanding on your body, you know, just not just mentally, but just physically, you know, you've, uh, you've, you've got to be in pretty good shape, actually. Um, otherwise, you struggle, you know, because it's, um, it's full on. It's full on. I mean, it's, I mean, it's an incredible thing to do. It's great fun. But I think um, what one of the most common things that I, I hear, you know, we've, we've, we've had different people on the road with us over the years. Um, like recently, uh, we've had a young lad coming out with us um, called Niles, who's been doing the merchandise with us. And he's 23. Uh, I mean, he said to us a few times, you know, he's tired. You know, because you are literally, you just don't stop. You, you're never in one place for more than a day, and you're always on the move. So it's, um, yeah. Do you find that you sort of, <laughs> you find you sort of, I think resent's a strong word, but let's say you're, you're pleased that it's over when it ends, and you get a few few days or weeks off. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, the thing is, it's kind of like, it's like a two-edged sword really it's like uh, you've got the gig which is the buzz and the high which is like it's like it's like it's like a drug you know it's like um it's such a great feeling and then you know the next morning you know and 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 this is, is when i say it's physically grueling and draining this is if you're not if, even if you're not partying you're not having a few beers every night and staying you know even if you try and you know be sensible and go to bed and don't drink it's you, you, you're still knackered you know um so even yeah, you know, Niles sort of said, "Wow, yes, you know, it's pretty full on, isn't it? You know, because you never stop." Um, so it's um, rude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. It, it keeps, so so to answer, sorry, to answer your question, am I glad when I get home? When I first get home, if it's been like a three-week tour, yeah, I'm glad to just have a week or so, not a lot, you know, not having to get up first thing whatever but then a week later i'm ready for more you're ready for more yeah but the other thing is as well it's like you know outside of all this we've all got normal lives you know i'm i've got a wife and three kids so, <laughs> you know so i get i can't you know i can't just take a week off when i get home you know I'm, i come back and you know that um, begins yeah uh, and i mean you know my, my youngest is five um but i mean i've my I've got two other kids as well who are kind of like grown up now. So that, you know, having three kids in the house, you know, the older two have kind of moved out now. But, uh, but yeah, you know, you come back and just normal life resumes, you know. Um, You've got to do your washing. You <laughs> <laughs> All this stuff. It's just, yeah, I think that the highlight reel of, you know, the touring musician, um, that's what people generally tend to share on their socials. But a lot of the other stuff you don't see, and that's the stuff that, um, can really, you know, wear you out. Yeah. So what's your current touring rig, briefly? Has it changed much from when <laughs> you were on that pedal show? Uh, not really, no. It's still basically the wet-dry setup that Mick helped me uh, arrive at. Uh, yeah, the two amps with my... In fact, it's that exact rig, actually, yeah. It's the two amps with the board that Mick built for me. With the Elder and Ash board, um, I think no, the, I've added two things to it. I've added a wah pedal and a fuzz, uh, a Reeves fuzz, which I've got on the front end of it. But other than that, yeah, it's the, it's the same ring. Do you, do you prefer? Obviously, it's quite in terms of some some boards, it's quite a simple rig, isn't it? Yeah. Oh do, God, do yeah. You prefer it's that nice. way. Yeah, I'm not. Into, I'm not into having too much to negotiate on a gig. I'm, I'm very much just a guitar and an amp guy, really. Um, I don't like too much. I just like. I, I like the guitar to sound as real as possible into the amp. So, uh, you know, which which involves a bit of volume, of course, mm -hmm. it does. Um, but it's you know it's manageable. And I suppose, yeah, going to see Mick, you know, just adding a bit of delay and a bit of harmonic trem was just a bit of extra something because we're, you know, we're going out as a three-piece now. So. I know that you've um, you've made 
me change watching that that pale show show with you it made me change my whole rig now i've done the whole really use, yeah using the volume more to control the gain so it cost me yeah. money because i'm now looking at boost pedals <laughs> well the thing is it's like i i did it I, well I've, I've done it like that for years because like the first few amps that i had i only really started buying pedals on it probably about 10 years ago uh, but before that, I probably had about four pedals, and I always got the overdrive from the amp, so I, d- I just naturally just turned the guitar down to clean it up. But, yeah. And I suppose I've, it's just that's part of what I do, and um, I think that there's a lot of sound in different texture tone that lives along the sweep part, the volume part. Mm. It's, it's, you know, so many people just pen, and that's just it's like an on and off switch. Whereas you get so many variations in terms of you know your overdrive and how it responds to stuff just by yeah you know try it, as, as you've obviously tried <laughs> yeah it's a it's a wild ride yeah but, um yeah so what's um what's your future plans then what's you got then obviously you've got more gigs you've got more recording more albums coming up so I've just I've just started writing the last few months. Um, just getting a few ideas down, which I just do here in my little home studio. Um, I, I tend to I mean I've always done it. I just I write in isolation. I just basically lock myself in my room, and I just get absorbed in it, and I'll just write and write and write uh, until I've got something that I think is presentable. Then I'll send it to the band, or maybe try it at a gig, try and sound check. Um, and then if it ends up being gigs, then it might end up on an album, might not. But yeah, I'm just, I'm just writing. And then obviously we've got quite a bit of touring this year. The other thing that we're hopefully going to do later this year, we're going to get the vinyl version of the album out, Ooh. which is cool because lots of, it seems to be quite a thing now. Everybody's into it. So, well, yeah. Everyone's talking about the vinyl, aren't they? They skipped over tapes, which is probably for the best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But... It, I, th- I think a lot of it's, it's a lot, there's quite a lot of like nostalgia involved in it. It's, it's you know, it is a different listening medium. It? It, I mean, does it sound? It, it, yeah, it definitely sounds different. Um, but it's a bit like when CDs, you know, like it's like MP3s now and, and streaming. So like, you know, when people have like you know cupboards and racks full of CDs, now it's just on a little yeah. memory stick, and then it's going you know, going full circle. So like things always do, you know. Ooh, and last question, what is your tip that you think everybody should do for practicing or performing? Is it something you've sort of discovered recently and you're like, that's helped me? Okay, um, my tip for practicing or performance is focus on one thing. I think these days, because I, I did quite a lot of teaching during the lockdowns with Zoom, and the one thing that I did pick up on from a lot of my students was they've seen right this this YouTube video, this guy doing this thing. So I want to do a bit of that. And I've seen this other guy, he does this really cool thing. I want to do a bit of that. And I've seen this other thing, and I want to do it. And it's like they'll they'll pra- they'll practice, but what they'll tend to do is just just basically play noodle up and down the same thing that they always do. Uh, and I do it, you know, we all do it, you know, you've got your, your go-to licks or your go-to thing, so you'll pick up a guitar and you just end up playing the same thing, which is which is what we all do. I think the best advice I could give is that's absolutely fine, but if you want to get better, is actually have a focused practice regime where, say, for instance, you say, right, half an hour today, I'm going to completely leave everything I already know and I'm going to work on something new. And I'm going to work on that new thing until I've absolutely nailed it and not move away from it. Because I think the problem is, I say with the internet, YouTube, social media, there's so much stuff. It's like, oh, that's cool. Oh, that's cool. Oh, I want to do that. Oh, I want to be that guy. Oh, I want to be that. It, there's just so much distraction there. Whereas when I first learned to play, I listened to my dad's records and I would literally just have the thing on repeat until I could nail it, until I could make it sound the same. And then when I could make it sound the same, I'd work on making it sound even closer than I'd previously got it. And I'd just work on that one thing until I'd got it and then I'd move on. Whereas I think these days, the tendency is to learn a bit of everything. 
but unless you, you know, there's a lot of guitarists out there that can play a bit of everything, but unless you know how to apply a bit of everything, mm. it's, it, it's almost like it's redundant. It's like knowing all all the licks and all the scales, but if you don't know how to apply it, and you've not figured out how to use that one lick over a certain kind of song, then it's kind of, it's a bit pointless knowing it. If that makes sense. Yeah, makes, yeah you kind of know how to yeah. piece yeah. it together. Just, just, yeah, just, just focus practice. And like, before you try something new, work out what is it you want to achieve? What is it you want to do? And how are you going to do it? And how are you going to learn it? And how are you going to use it? Because um, there's a, quite a lot of people that I taught um, go straight to the lead stuff, the lead guitar stuff. And they, but they don't know what to do with this lead guitar stuff that they've learned. They've got no idea how it applies to chords or to music. So, yeah, it, yeah, it just it just needs to be yeah. I'd say focus learning and focus practice and know why it is you're learning a certain thing. That's a very long answer to a very short question. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so do you do you still quote unquote practice? Do you still find time to sit down and go through things? Um. Not so much these days. Most of the time, if I pick up the guitar, it's if it's something I'm working on. It's normally I'm writing a song or I'm trying to come up with something new. I wouldn't say I necessarily sit down and practice and try to learn new new stuff in terms of technique. I will try and come up with new stuff in terms of melodies and chord structures and you know in a songwriting context. Um, so I'd say when I do sit down, it's it's a focused. Yeah. People normally are trying to, you know, work a new riff or a new thing. Lovely. But it's it's very easy when I do that to just just to to do that, and then within five minutes I'm just plugged in, you know, and, and I'm dialing in my Stevie Ray Vaughan tone, and I'm doing my playing the old shit I normally do. <laughs> <laughs> Got to keep it fun now, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing. At the end of the day, you know, we all play guitar because we love playing guitar. And, you know, it, it's, it, if you play if you play half an hour every day, maybe just, you know, half of those days just play what you love playing and then the other half just try and work on something new. And then it's a balance, isn't it? Yeah, of course. 